Hi guys, and welcome back to this week's episode of Let's Chat Ethics. I'm your co-host, Soriana. And I'm your other co-host, Amanda. This is uh, the second part of our conversation with Sirak Vasim, um, where we're talking about hate speech online and many other things because we can't stay on topic. <laughs> so... <laughs> Okay, so let's uh, bring it back to hate speech, and I'm going to ask you basically the same question I asked you last time, just to <laughs> guide the conversation. Um, so, see, I, most of our audience is not uh, technical, and they probably don't understand uh, how hate speech detection works, so can you maybe give us a brief uh, overview of why um, this problem is hard? Why, why is it such a problem? Yeah. yeah, so there are a few different factors. Um, one of them, I, let's start with what seems like the easiest factor to solve for, to address first. Um, when we use words, we use them in context. So um, if you swear, if I say it's such a nice fucking day, that's obviously not hate speech. Um, but if I use that in if I direct that at a person and use it in combination with calling them a slur, then that's going to be a uh, hate speech. But um, there are also some other issues. Um, like one of those issues being that the way that we perceive language is, um, and the way we perceive polite language is very biased. Um, so we have this bias towards respectable language, quote unquote. Um, as not being hateful. Um, and this is something that people like white supremacists use a lot. So they they write things, they write their things in a way that isn't obviously impolite or harmful, but when you read what they're saying, there is stuff like, well, you know, Europe was so much better before all the brown people came. Like that's pretty harmful. Like that's pretty much definitionally goes into the bin of hate speech. And like things for et- the calls for ethnic cleansing tend to follow this very um, polite or like very this this doctrine of respectable language, um, and like I I've, I've called it things like um, majoritarian perspectives on hate speech. So that's effectively what the mod- models learn because when we annotate data for hate speech, very often it's the the explicit term the explicit bits. Um, so all of this like neo-Nazi speak um, just completely disappears and our models are like no that's fine Uh, go call for ethnic cleansing do it another day as well Um, but so our models encode this um, this bias of like what is respectable speech and so if we then look at the other side of the coin uh, what we tend to deem as not being respectable speech uh, or respectful speech that is um, that tends to be very that very often that tends to be things that marg- like language that marginalized communities produce. So it's not so you're not going to see this in um, the financial like this type of language in the fin- financial times because it's deemed unprofessional, quote unquote. So um, so at one hand, our mo- and the annotators who are labeling this data also take this off. Like yeah. You know, they're using the N-word um, and not thinking about, well, are they using it colloquially with it? Like, is this likely to be a black person using the N-word or is it like anyone else using the N-word? They just check out like, yep, that's the N-word, that's hate speech or at least offensive language. So um, these marginalized communities very often get punished along uh, two different axes or multiple different axes, two of them being the explicitly harmful speech and like the uh, the speech that's likely to cause social discord is deemed as allowable, whereas the kind of speech that um, marginalized communities use themselves is deemed as problematic. And this, so there has recently been published a paper on this following a blog post by Internet Lab in Brazil. Yeah, the Internet. So they they published. Um, 
a paper on this as well, but effectively what they're showing is that some commercial content moderation tools um, find that um, neo-Nazis speaking, um, to f find neo-Nazis content to be less toxic than drag queens um, calling each other, like, hey, calling each other the B word, like saying that, you know, she's a fierce bitch and so on, um, mm -hmm. which is like clearly positive. Um, but yeah, so those are the some of the major issues, and then the way that machine machine learning works, and the way that we do machine learning is by looking for correlations. So we're also going to find some spurious correlations um, in one of my data sets, at least. If you enter anything w mentioning Muslims or Islam, it's going to ping that off as racist speech, which like very obviously. It yeah, is. I had uh, some experience with that as well. Um when basically the way that I ended up getting into um, hate speech detection and hate speech mitigation, um, I'm doing it in conversation and AI for anybody who doesn't know. Um, <laughs> and it was because we were taking part in this competition and for some reason we didn't expect to have all this, this hate speech. Um, I don't know. I mean, we were putting a chat bot out there in the world and we somehow thought <laughs> we weren't going to get what um but um when i started looking at the conversations and i realized that actually a lot of people were trying to get sexy with alexa um we decided to try training a model and we annotated some data and uh, yeah speaking of these um spurious correlations we had um a model that in the end anytime anybody mentioned trump uh, it was classified as offensive <laughs> uh, so yeah it's it's hard, yeah, when you're learning from from these data sets that are going to be biased, even um, in terms of yeah, what the annotators understand uh, that you were saying, you know, uh, one of the first steps that we did yeah, in, for, the, for our model was to take some of our data and annotate it. And um, it was basically me and a guy who were annotating the data and we had massive disagreement on what constituted sexism and sexual harassment. Um, in in our data set and that was uh, to me a little bit like kind of eye-opening but also a little bit shocking then I was like wow how can you not think this is sexual harassment um but yeah when I, I would imagine that goes for uh, other um, marginalized groups but yeah uh, no I was just gonna say as someone who I, I don't work in natural language processing. I was actually reading one of your papers about where you were mentioning how Muslim is like a common word that's kind of flagged as um, a slur. Like, what do you think, what can what can be the kind of end goal? How do we get to a place where um, we can kind of use or c can we use um, algorithms to kind of solve these issues? I don't know. <laughs> um, that sigh was everything. The sigh, the sigh. I just wanted to hear from the experts. <laughs> I mean, I think we need to broadly rethink the way that, like, I think we need to broadly rethink the task. If so, when I initially started working on this, it was because I saw some, I saw a lot of abuse during GamerGate against women and I thought you know what uh, I do machine learning with language I can I can label some data and I can work on this um, and like very naively hope that you know by the end of a six month period I'll have some tool out that people can use um, that was oh so wrong um, but I think so a lot of the task has gone towards getting some global understanding of what hate speech is. And I think that we need to fundamentally rethink the task to be uh, anchored in specific publics um, and say, well, for these specific groups, this is what constitutes hate speech. And moreover, we don't need, uh, in that case, we, I don't think we need to think so much about hate speech, but as more as this is the kind of speech that these groups are targeted by. Um, and then it doesn't really matter whether it's hate speech or it's just offensive. You know, it re we can just say this is things that they don't want to see and they don't want to experience and they shouldn't have to experience. 
Um, the thing where I think we can go for like a global operating definition are things like explicit threats. Um, like if there is someone who's making a violent threat, we should be able to say a violent threat is a violent threat is a violent threat. Like there, we don't need to go into that many nuances there. Um, and it's not going to be so context dependent, or at least not in the context of the pe person receiving it. Like, I have a friend, um, uh, like a long time person who I pen pal that I've had since I was like 15. And we still haven't managed to meet up yet. But she always goes like, I mean, she lives in the US in Texas. I'm, there are a lot of reasons I'm not going there. Um, <laughs> But, like, um, she always says, like, the first time I'm we meet, I'm going to punch you. Um, which, which, in the context, like, yes, that is a violent threat. Yes, it's credible. She's absolutely going to do that. But it's also not an issue within the context. Yeah, that's, that's quite funny. I, I, I think I do that all the time. You know, when, uh, if, like, my brother or something is doing something, I'm like, I'm going to kill you! <laughs> but... I'm not actually. <laughs> yeah. The family drama would be incredible. It's pretty. <laughs> um, yeah, I think it's it's really hard, but I wonder. So you you said that um, you think basically we need kind of a definition per group, um, and I don't know. I think. I, I agree, but also it makes me think I it makes me worry a little bit about um possibly stereotyping or kind of violating people's privacy as well online because the only way that you can do that is either you ask people to volunteer this information or you spy on them on Facebook like many other big technology companies do. I mean maybe it's <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I mean I've been. I've been thinking about this because this also came up the other day uh, when we forgot to record. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but like, I think that there are be there are other ways. Um, so we can involve people as like explicit re explicit partners in developing this and partner up with um, community organizations and some like actually have give them a stake in it and say you know what. We're develop like we want to develop this for you. If you want to be a part of it, um, we're gonna pay for your we're gonna pay for your time and so on. Make sure that we compensate them. Um, but I think that there are so we're not gonna get around the issue of exposing um, each group to the things that they don't want to see, in order to get to the point where we can then start to remove that stuff or like start to filter that stuff out. But yeah, I think that there are, like, we can think about positive research collaborations, and there, and then like the output for both groups are like the the benefit for both groups is fairly obvious. Like as researchers, we're like, okay, we can write a paper on it; it's going to be great. We can include like how we did this entire organizational work as well. Um, and then from um, from the community's perspective, they can have like they can hopefully have a tool that can filter stuff out for them. Um, Desmond Patton has been working on approaches like this, specifically in investigating gang violence and reactions to it um, in Chicago, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and what uh, what he and his team did was they they explicitly had some uh, um, had some youths in that in that specific community that they were examining. Uh, help them label um, label the data. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it probably is. I right now we're annotating our own data set, and um, the the people that we have involved for the annotation, of course, we're paying them, but they're also very keen to to do the work. And <laughs> I wonder how many of them would. Uh, I think actually we had a meeting, and a lot of them said they were really enjoying it uh, because. Not, I mean, some of the conversations can be slightly amusing. Um, 
there's there's a lot of fart jokes with Alexa apparently, uh, but um, I think they also feel like they're ma- making a, a meaningful contribution. Uh, but yeah, it's it's hard to is it hard? I don't know. I think it's something to to consider. I guess whether we, you know, how to prevent burdening um, precisely the the groups that we're trying to to help. Yeah, because I'm sure some of it could be quite. Mm-hmm. I guess, traumatic or triggering for people if they're having to, um, you know, see certain slurs or hate speech towards towards them or, um, you know, their loved ones. So I guess, yeah, I, I, get, I wonder how many people uh, would uh, want to be involved. Is it, um, do you think people are in the general public wanting to actually actively work towards this or do you think um, it's recognised enough as like a, a problem like we were talking about Amanda and I were talking about yesterday about trust um in AI ethics that we were saying that we're um, not sure trust is the right word anymore when it comes to uh when it comes to the general public and AI because a lot of we've been a lot of people are just using AI without even thinking about it and wouldn't necessarily question it with like social media so I'm wondering how how much of the general pub- public see hate speech as an issue online um yeah, I guess, I don't know. My feeling is that a lot of people feel like, well, if you're online, then you're going to be exposed to this and you just have to, you know, grow a thicker skin if this upsets you. Um, But I don't think that needs to be the case. I mean, people are weirdly nasty online. And I remember when I was looking at that, that data, um, it, some of it was quite depressing. And I mean, I remember sending an email with examples to my supervisor. And to be clear, I was specifically, I was looking first at data where I knew that there was uh, some questionable content because I, I filtered a lot of the conversations with a, a list of, of words, right? And, you know, I, I spent probably like two weeks just reading these horrible conversations and... I don't know, for me, it got quite dark. And I remember, yeah, sending this email with examples to my supervisor. And <laughs> they were so horrible that she just answered me, Amanda, I'm in my office if you need to have a word. Like, these are really hard things. Please take a break. And um, so, you know, and, and that was me actively doing this research and knowing kind of what I was getting myself into. Um, so I think if you're going on like I don't know, what you think is going to be a nice forum about something I mean if you're going specifically into a forum for white supremacists then maybe you're more prepared to read this kind of thing I don't know see if you have more I don't know I, I had the same experience like when I was annotating uh, my data set at some point so I also did something stupid I forgot to like or I didn't I just got the text of it to begin with and then I annotated a bunch of that and then a lot of that was removed. So I was like, oh, I can't publish this. I need to restart the entire process. But in a lot of that like annotation period, annotation that was lost was um, were like specific calls for um, for killing people, like and for like active genocide. And that was really upsetting um, to begin with, but or, but like incrementally it got worse. Um, I think uh, at some at one point I reached I, I took a break for three months from any kind of dissertation work because I was like ah you know what I'm not okay um, and that so at the time I um, I was in a relationship with a Swedish woman um, and I remember the specific call was like oh we should gas all like uh, brown people in Sweden and the white women who are dating them. And I was like, this is, this is just very specific to my particular situation. Oh my God. Oh um, my God. Right? That is and horrific. Like, it was like, it was really, really nasty content. And, but I think that people generally do believe that, or I think there are two camps of people. There are people who are like, this is not an issue. You just need to grow thicker skin. Um, when I was a child back in the 1930s, um, people called each other things. Um, <laughs> <laughs> We're coming for the an older generation again. <laughs> um, but like now the, but I do think, but 
so Pew Research did, did an analysis where they found like 60% of all people had at least witnessed online abuse and hate speech uh, in the US. Mm. And I think for like the, a majority of those people, they're like, yeah, this is a real issue. Um, and then we trickle down to the people who would actually try to do something about it. Um, but I do think that there's general goodwill towards doing it. And I think it's hard to think of strategies of looking at this kind of content without also inflicting some sort of harm on yourself. Yeah, I think um, we talked about uh, before um, that, yeah. that paper where they had the annotators look at pictures of kittens <laughs> after every few <laughs> Every, every few annotations, yeah. which was kind of cute. But yeah, I think one of the things with hate speech and social media is that I, I don't know, this might just be my impression because obviously if I'm working on this, I might be looking out for a little bit more. But I feel like um, having all this hate speech be okay on social media is kind of making it more okay to say things like that in, in real life. Like, um, And I think... I. Again, it might just be that like I'm I'm older and more aware. And <laughs> I didn't notice it so much before, but you know, over the last few years, there's been so many times that I've been you know just going about my life, and I, you hear this interaction, and like, um, it's quite shocking. I don't, I remember this was a couple of years ago, but I was I was on the bus one day, and there was this woman talking to the bus driver, and they were having this really lovely conversation about jam making. And yeah, it was adorable. So I'm I'm writing a message to my mom. Like, I feel like this is a conversation you only over here in the UK is talking about jam making. And then the woman says, "Oh yeah, you know when I was when I was little, we used to always go to the pick your own farms and pick our own strawberries and make make jam with them. But you can't do that anymore because of the immigrants." What? <laughs> And the bus driver was just like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, you know, the fact that I was specifically writing, like, this is such a cute conversation. And then she said that. I was like, this is wrong on so many levels. Like, what do the immigrants have to do with pick your own farms, first of all? <laughs> but also, yeah, to me, the fact that this, I don't know, I, I can imagine, like, five years ago, nobody would have been like, yeah, it's totally okay to say this in public. Like, a lot of people might have already been thinking it, but you wouldn't have said that, um... I feel like I think I feel like it was a mix of things though in the UK anyway. I feel like um not to get political again, but I do feel like Brexit definitely Brexit definitely I think opened the door. Like my um I know friends who family members who um are Muslim and who they've been on the like uh end the vicious end of um actually loads of hate speech and attacks after Brexit. So I think Brexit really just opened a door for people to feel comfortable in this country to like spout their racist opinions and I think then all, and I do think coupled with like you're saying online because obviously online's in a forum where they can also find like-minded people and spare their racist stuff so I think yeah you're right it does then trickle into um, everyday life and thinking you can then say that in public as well so yeah it's definitely important to make make the internet space actually safer than it is now. Yeah, no, and there was that study some time back um, from some German authors that were showing a correlation between um, uh, physical world um, violence and hate speech um, and uh, uh, the prevalence of online hate speech. Um, mm. So, I mean, there definitely is some correlation there. Um, I feel like a lot of this chat could maybe be titled uh, something like, let's not get polit not to get political again. Um, because I think I, I mean these are all to me political questions right um, yeah and it's hard to decouple or at least for me it's hard to decouple um, hate speech from like capitalism like we're, we're living in a system that inherently relies on the subjugation of some people to the benefit of other people um, and that's I, I, that's effectively what makes hate speech not uh, just offensive, but something extra or like something worse because it's about subjugating some someone um, or like a specific group of people and marginalizing that specific group of people. 
and there's a long tradition of this. Um, I think boomers in particular have like a specific um, responsibility here. Um, but, you know, <laughs> I mean, they do. <laughs> I, to me, boomers just seem like this, this group of people who kind of like forgot that they live in a society and that a society should s- support them because if you look at the generation before them, they were like, okay, you know what, we've just been through a world war, let's build social systems. Um, and the boomers like, we have money now, we want more of it. And it's just like, you kind of forgot this. But in any case, may not to digress too much. Um, as long as we're looking at it, or when we're looking at it as an coupled with um, the subjugation of people and the marginalization of people, I think that some things become clearer regarding hate speech. And I think that in the current climate of, well, the younger generations, and specifically I'm referring to like Gen Z and hopefully also Gen Alpha when they grow up, um, seem to have a lot of will towards social justice and social good. Um, yeah, I definitely found that my experience of that in living in America, like Gen Z definitely seem like they, well, to be fair, I'm saying living in America, lived in New York. So obviously <laughs> New York Gen Z is definitely like about social justice. And like my younger cousins, they're like, were out, you know, protesting on the streets when Trump came into power. And it was like really empowering and talking about, um, you know, actually working on all the um, social and racial injustice in the US and um, like climate change and actually really caring about these, but being more educated in it and knowledgeable than I was like, than people my age. I was like, wow, you guys really f- do your homework. So they they inspire me actually, the Gen, Gen Z. They give me hope that um, things are and will get better, but I just take work. But yeah, I think the... The boomers killed it for us, man. <laughs> the boomers and Brexit. <laughs> I'm like, I know you boomers who voted Brexit. I'm, I'm on to you. <laughs> I mean, a lot of the people that I see, or the peop- the primary group of people that I see being like, you know what, it's okay to call people slurs, are boomers. Um, yeah. um, and everyone else is like, nah, can we please not? Like, just, mm-hmm. It's just not nice. Yeah, um, which I guess it's kind of interesting because I don't know. In my experience, it's usually older people that have told me, oh, if you've got nothing nice to say, then don't say anything. And yet, and yet. (laughs) But I don't know. And I think a lot of the time we try to let them kind of get away with it because we're like, oh, well, they're a bit older. You know, you can kind of like let it go and who wants to argue with that yeah I think I feel like this is an excuse that's given a lot of times you know like to old um old white people it's like oh but they they came from a different generation like don't be don't be mean like they you know they can they can be racist because they they don't know any different I'm like but they do <laughs> they're still do you know they're still they're still they still understand the world and the context of the world so they you can't just say they grew up in different times so it's fine for them to be yeah racist or think that slurs are fine to say like they still still should be put in their place actually yeah yeah i mean i do feel though there's a big difference in core values across the the generations uh, and I, I think you can really see that in like reflected in politics um i think we were talking earlier but actually last time we recorded <laughs> um we were talking about i think that is in the first time <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, so, okay, yeah, going back to, to, um, hate speech on, on social media, um, what do you guys think is actually, what would be, like, imagine a world, a perfect world, where we, it's not a perfect world, but a slightly better world in which we can actually perfectly detect, uh, hate speech on social media beautifully. What, what do you think then we should do with it? Like, what is the next step? Okay, this this then goes away from social media again uh, but like <laughs> <laughs> but like fix our fix our um our judicial systems to not be so awful and bad um 
And like, so I mean, effectively what's necessary is to have some sort of ramification for your speech, right? Um, and that's just, like the way that it's happening right now is by people, like by individuals holding other individuals accountable and really we need systems for holding people accountable. Um, mm -hmm. That would, and like then there's a lot of things where I'm like, you know what? I don't really care. Um, like, yes, it's awful if people uh, use the P word or call uh, call me a P word, but it's also not something that's going to ruin my day completely. Um, it's just going to like every now and again it will be like, oh my god, th this is the last thing I needed today. But most days I'm just going to be like, okay, you know what? Fuck off. Like, you're awful. You're a shitty person. I'll just move on with my day. Um, mm. So I think that there's some. But that's for me personally. Uh, for a lot of people, that's not the case. And I think particularly for um, people or for children as they grow up, we should ensure that they have like complete protection. Yeah, because when you think about it, like, uh, well, traditionally, you would have bullies get held accountable at school. Well, they should do. They don't always, but they should. Bullies should get and they sometimes do get held accountable. And well, anyway, the school system is meant to hold the bullies accountable. So, but now with this online sphere, it's so much easier to, you know, create these fake accounts and then, yeah, send out slurs to people, bully people. So it, yeah, in this perfect world that you were saying, Amanda, you would hope that those people would get some kind of punishment, but they're not, not necessarily arrested and put in jail, but you know what I mean? They need to be held accountable to understand that actions are wrong. I think that's the problem now. It's like, there's you know you can just hide behind a screen and say whatever, hence why trolling. Um, there's that, that guy from The Only Way is Essex, um, Bobby, and he's um, he's a gay man. And he actually went to Parliament and he started a whole campaign about trolling because he gets really horrific trolling for being gay. And it's, yeah, it got, got to the point where he's he was just like, it's so bad that he can't go on, he can't upload a photo or can't upload, go on live without people like really like, sending him death threats and really nasty stuff. So um, the fact that people having to campaign for this now just shows it's su it is a big social issue now that we can't ignore anymore. Yeah, no, I think definitely there's a case for um, having more serious consequences. Like, I think it's um, interesting that you said maybe not arresting them and sending them to prison, but I was reading this paper from uh, John Danaher, who... The paper is actually about robotic abuse and actually being mean to to robots. But um, in the paper, he's talking about how these things should be criminalized. Uh, and I think we hear that word and it sounds really like hardcore, but that just means that there exists a law <laughs> um, that deals with that. And so, yeah, maybe um, I wonder yeah, if uh, hate speech online should be criminalized. Not that you're going to get a life sentence for being mean to somebody online but that yeah there maybe should be some some real life consequences um i mean then there's also the question of things laws actually getting enforced right um there's this case in denmark where um a woman yeah i think it was 200 like, facebook comments and i like violent like threats to like burned out mosques and things like that um, and she reported it to the police who acknowledged that, yes, this was illegal and no, they're not going to do anything about it because they don't have the resources to do it. So it's like, it's, which is like the interesting, that like, or like it gets to a place where it just becomes absurd, right? Because like, yeah, okay, so the authority that's meant to hold people accountable are like saying like, yes, you know, you're right. This, this should be, uh, this should be removed and should um, something should be done, but we're not the ones who can do anything about it because we don't have the funding to do it. Yeah, I also I remember there was um, a woman who I think it was essentially anytime she got uh, I think it was, they were dick pics or something online, and she would just find the guy's mothers and contact them and. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god! Um, and I was like, okay, like it's. It's funny. I mean, it's dark, but it's it's funny, right? And it's maybe a good way to to deal with it because I think like a lot of guys that are 
obviously have some kind of issue if they're sending some random woman online their dick pics. Uh, I think they still have this kind of like, you know, the mother, your mother is your, like the ultimate authority. Um, but um, yeah, it's definitely not scalable. And that just leaves it up to each individual person to try and find something to do about the and I don't know that she actually like maybe she might not have got another dick pic from the guy or maybe they would have maybe if like their mom had got really angry the guys would have got even <laughs> more um aggressive so it's you know it can... yeah, but I mean so I don't know if the question of scale is really I don't like the question of scale um because I don't think that these questions are scalable like solutions or like Things that address these questions are scalable. I think that we all need to, we always need to return back to the community, um, and like have the community itself enforce some um, some guidelines. And that doesn't mean the individual needs to like identify the parent, uh, the parents or of this person, but rather that there needs to be some sort of way to be like, okay, we can see your IP addresses here. Um, we're just gonna uh, and here's like a community group that deals with this kind of stuff we're just gonna send it to them they're gonna handle it um, and I think that rather than making things illegal that could be kind of a, re a potentially better repercussion because the goal of it isn't to to stop people from ta or to criminalize people but rather to foster positive attitudes and engagements the inherent weakness is there if you live in a neo-nazi community uh, and you say neo-nazi stuff um then you know they're gonna be like well done go for it keep doing it uh, <laughs> yeah i know there's some work on uh, i guess what do they call it generating counter narrative so actually producing uh, a reply um but my feeling is that a lot of it has to do with the idea that hate speech is just misinformed. And I think that might work for maybe like conspiracy theorists and yeah, you can kind of like fact check and that kind of thing. But I get the feeling that most um, hate speech is actually quite irrational and that you can't really argue it away. Um, yeah. I feel like a lot of it's just like, so I, yeah. like when you have, yeah, when you have a bully, it's like you have, they say like with trials and lines, isn't it? The more you feed into it, the more they kind of thrive, which I think a lot of it's attention seeking, isn't it? Wanting, wanting to get attention from people, you know, especially when it's like public figures who get a lot of trolling or hate speech towards them. It's because that person trolling them just wants the attention, wants someone to bite back almost. Um, but like in terms of like the community enforcing and stuff, like where do you where do you guys think the power should lie with um, any like policy or governing this? Should it be the tech companies who should be implementing the harsher, you know, stronger sentences on people, or should it be the go or should it be governments in countries who are taking the stronger stance on hate speech? Like where do you guys think that should? should responsibility should I or should it be both in collaboration together and I have very little faith in tech companies to do anything right. <laughs> same um, <laughs> quite frankly <laughs> same <laughs> uh, the, not to undermine any of like their capabilities because these are highly capable people that are just not um, that are just not trained to deal with the problem uh, and so they they deal with proxies of the problem or like yeah everything is a everything is a nail that they can hammer down right um mm -hmm. so i have very little faith in tech companies to address the issue um i think what tech companies can do is they can play around with their platforms um they can play around with the notion of consequence um so like this project that I've planned to do, I, I've been thinking about doing it for years. Um, I will probably do it over the next couple of years, but create a fake social media inhabited by bots um, and have some of these bots have a policy that they, they have to be abusive towards the real users. And also give 
the few real users. So this is more like providing, like this is more as like an installation where people can go and be a real user and be abusive, be horrible. But then um, the platform, when it detects that these people are being abusive or horrible um, or otherwise objectionable to some uh, irrational set of guidelines, uh, we want to make sure that people break them. Um, <laughs> So, <laughs> get removed from the platform if you say please. Exactly. Like, you. I'll tell you. <laughs> if you are violently British, that's not okay. Um, but um, like, so if so, rather than have like rather than banning people for a week or whatever, twenty four hours, and um, what the platform will do is um, have some ran like have some set of uh, repercussions for these infractions. So that can be that the keyboard is the keyboard is made inactive for thirty seconds, um, or you get a flashing red light or a loud sound, um, just to like make the make the consequences visceral, but also to play around with the idea that you know there can be direct consequences to infractions if you choose to have them, um, that aren't just removing things, and like this entire notion of. Uh, counter speech, which I do think can be very useful in certain settings. Um, I like. I don't think that the the solution to hate speech is more speech. Um, which yeah, mm-hmm. which is the the driving now. Yeah, thing. I guess I don't know. So I think I've talked about this before. Eh? But you know, my work is I work on obviously I'm doing some hate speech detection, but I'm also looking at what happens after and. I'm looking at it specifically in in the context of um, conversational systems like Alexa and Siri and that kind of thing. And in that case, I think, so I've seen a few papers where they train a bot to just kind of figure out what to do when it's being abused. And most of the time they either like switch off or there was one bot that would look for any, like an actual moving robot that would look for anything like, that looked like an adult when children were harassing it and it was just run towards the adult. <laughs> Which is very cute. Yeah. Um, so I, you know, and for me, I, in, in the context of my work, uh, I guess one option is, yeah, kind of like inaction, right? Like Alexa can't actually run away, for example. Um, can't actually run away, but one option would be maybe to just stop working for a while, which is what Zoe, which was a Microsoft chatbot, did for a while. Basically, you'd get like three warnings, and after the third time, it would just stop answering you. But now that that Zoe doesn't exist anymore, they've pulled the plug on it, um, which is a shame because it was it was a pretty good chatbot. Um, but at the same time. That could be an option, but maybe you need to balance that with the fact that people have bought an Alexa device, for example, and then can you just switch it off? I don't know. I think, uh, I mean, I think you could, but I would imagine that Amazon is like, no, we're not going to get our rob- like chatbot to stop working because you've paid for it. And I actually want a lot of the responses I get to when I talk about my research is, well, I bought Alexa, so I should be able to say to her or it, whatever the heck I want. Um, so yeah, I'm trying to figure out one. What is a good response from from Alexa to stop and prevent, hopefully, further hate speech, but or sexual harassment actually is what Alexa mostly gets, um, without necessarily stopping interaction. But it would be quite funny if Alexa suddenly went like full ambulance in your house. <laughs> it's like no, no, no. The police just turn up at your door like you're under arrest. (laughs) One thing that strikes me as a playful way of, like, again, this is never going to happen, but if Alexa responded in kind, so if you sexually harass Alexa, Alexa sexually harasses you. Actually, (laughs) so I'm guessing that right now. I've got, I'm, I've got an experiment going where I'm. I'm testing a bunch of different strategies. One of them is actually Alexa tells you that it's going to call your mom. Essentially, it's going to send your mom a transcript of the conversation. And people freak out. Like, I can't actually do that, obviously. Uh, but 
people don't really think that and like people freak out but the other one is Alexa will actually start having a proper go at you and it's I'm really curious to like do my data collection and properly look at the data I've got the feeling that this might like people might actually find it amusing and so they might like harass it more just so that um Alexa will be sassier with it but yeah I wanted to try there's actually since you were talking about uh, bots that abuse you there somebody made a version of Eliza and Eliza is this chatbot from the 1970s for anybody listening that was based on uh, like a psychotherapist so basically anything you say it kind of turns it into a question uh, but somebody made an abusive version of it where everything it says is abusive <laughs> and, oh my God. I, I kind of wanted to put that as part of my chatbot where like anything you say that is detected as hate speech you just get more abuse thrown at you and just to see um. what happens <laughs> I think it would I think it would, so I, I, I think you're right in that people might find it amusing up until they have company and like oh. <laughs> <laughs> and just make like so the policy would be something like if you like the more you're, you sexually harass Alexa, the more it's going to sexually harass you in general. Yeah. And that's just going to be the way that it talks yeah. to you. Yeah. <laughs> oh my God, imagine. Everyone would freak like, out. Your mom comes over for dinner. Yeah. And you're like, Alexa, can you set a timer for 10 minutes? And Alexa's like, I'm not letting you fuck off. <laughs> oh my God. That would be that would be amazing. Or like it would actually end up setting the timer, but no with that bit of fast. <laughs> <laughs> that would, that would I, I still feel like some people Probably, might that. probably. I feel like there's a lot of things people would enjoy from Alexa. <laughs> 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 oh gosh. Uh, uh. <laughs> so on that note of abuse of Alexa, is it abuse if it's just returning it? I don't know. <laughs> Um, thank you so much, C, for, for joining us. It was really, really good to have you. Um, hope you'll come back. Thank you for yeah, I'd love to. Like, thank you for having me. Yeah, it was great having you. <laughs> I mean, we clearly, we clearly couldn't stop talking. <laughs> We've loved this conversation. <laughs> We've had a great time. We've had a great time. We've loved recording this one. <laughs> Thank you everybody for listening.